Order members, it's now time for questions to the Minister for Education and we'll start with the listed questions. I call Patsy McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one. The current arrangements allow teachers to use a range of assessment techniques that suit the nature of the work being assessed and the purpose of the assessment, including assessment for baseline purposes. When not a statutory requirement, it is good practice for transition information to be passed to parents from their preschool settings. SIA introduced a transition form to assist this, although many settings have developed their own. Many preschool and year one teachers also meet in August September to discuss children's progress. Teachers are required to assess and report to parents on the cross curricular skills in the, fo- in the first years of every pupil's primary education. While this does not have to be done with reference to the levels of progression from year three, year one teachers may use SIA non statutory development stages in learning as a baseline tool in conjunction with the information gained from the preschool and parents. The development stages all show the, show the progression into level one of the levels of progression. This is intended to provide the first element of a coherent framework within which the process of an individual pupil and our cohort can be monitored. Teachers are also required to assess and report to parents on pupils' progress in areas of learning and other skills, thinking, skills, personal capabilities, etc. This assessment should be carried out in accordance with the school's own assessment policy, giving them the flexibility to suit the needs, interests and abilities of their pupils. I call Patsy McLoone for supplementary. Uh, um, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Um, but does the Minister not believe that baseline assessment is essential when a child enters primary one to identify what additional support is needed, if necessary, and to ensure the child is being taught at the most appropriate level? Thank the member for his question. Um, the best practice states that uh, baseline assessment information should be shared between either be the nursery school or the primary school or at later stages of a child's life between the post-primary or the primary school and the post-primary school. I have no plans as to make it uh, in terms of bringing forward legislation to make it essential, but I think best practice dictates that it should be the case. And many, many of our schools do carry out this work in case. And as I said in my answer to your original question. SIA do provide forms uh, for it to be transferred. Many settings use their own forms to do so. So I think best practice is used in the vast majority of our schools and those schools that do not use it, I think it would be in their own interest to use it as well as well as the pupils. I call Mervyn Storey. Uh, thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you Minister for, I'm not sure what was a yes or a no answer, but in terms of, of what the Minister has said in relation to the importance of teachers, and given the, the vital role that teachers play in relation to the assessment process currently in our schools. Will the Minister uh, listen to what teachers are saying rather than what has happened in the past in relation to computer-based assessment where the Minister and the Department failed to listen and we've had the disastrous situation with CPA? And will he give an assurance that context will also be taken into consideration in regards to the baseline process? Well, computer-based assessment clearly has had its problems. Uh, in regards to delivery on the ground, but the principle of computer-based assessment has been broadly welcomed among teachers themselves. And of course, the department will continue to listen to teachers, uh, their experiences in the classroom and their professional opinion uh, on moving these matters forward. I believe that the technical problems that existed within computer-based assessment can be resolved. We also have to look at the procurement issues around computer-based assessment and and ensure that uh, any system is allowed to bed in and that teachers have the opportunity to use it for a significant number of years, uh, both for in terms of benefit to the children and also benefit to the teachers as well. So all those lessons will continue to be learnt and I can assure the member I do listen to teachers as I progress through policy development. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I was listening too to the Minister to hear whether it was a yes or no. I'm still not quite sure either. But Minister, can you give us an indication, at least of a time scale, or a likely introduction date for baseline assessment for all pupils? Well, I think it's interesting that members want a yes or no answer in relation to assessment between primary school, nursery school and primary school. Because particularly the members' party has often said to me in this House, leave it up to the professional judgment of teachers. 
Now, if it is going to have to be statutory, I have to bring legislation before the House. We will have to set out in legislation how that assessment takes place. Is the member then saying I shouldn't leave it to the professionalism of teachers? We have to make up our mind in these matters. You can't have it both ways. Hence the reason I believe that the current system is capable of delivering the requirements to the benefit of the child. I do not believe we need uh, legislation at this time. The matter will be kept to, open to review. But I think, uh, without doubt, the vast, vast majority of our settings have a process in place which benefits the young people, and there is no requirement for legislation at this time. Moving on, I call David McElveen. Question number two, Mr Deputy Speaker. Regular school attendance is crucial in raising standards in education, ensuring that every child has full access to the curriculum and, most importantly, reach their full potential. The day-to-day -day management of pupil attendance is, of course, a matter for schools. Every school should have a clear strategy for managing and promoting pupil attendance. They must include a summary and evaluation of this in their school development plan. The Education and Training Inspectorate monitor this as part of the school inspection process. My department has provided guidance to schools in Circular 2013-13, attendance, guidance and absence recording by schools. This came into effect in the beginning of excuse me, the 13-14 uh, school year. This provides schools with good practice guidance and strategies to manage pupil attendance and includes an attendance policy template. I call David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware that uh, it has been highlighted that school attendance is a particular challenge at the moment amongst Protestant males. Um, I wonder, could the Minister indicate what resources his department is putting across specifically to deal with this issue? Um, the issue of education attainment among working class Protestant males has been highlighted, particularly through the, the Purvis report and other evidence. My department has in place uh, policies which support all sections of our community in relation to educational underattainment, though I do believe that there is also responsibility on community leaders, on uh, political representatives and those with influence within communities to emphasise the importance of education, the benefits of education. But of course the member will be aware that if you tell a child at 11 they failed, the child will automatically think it's not the education system's fault. It's their fault, and therefore they will disengage from education. So I would suggest that the member uh, reviews his own party policies in relation to education if he truly wishes to raise education attainment upon Protestant working class meals. I call Michaela Boyne. Good uh, Can I thank the Minister for uh, his answers? And can the Minister outline to the House uh, or expand an outline into the House what role families, communities alongside the school can play in improving school attendance? In approving, sorry, improving school attendance? Uh, clearly, there is a significant responsibility rests uh, with parents and the family and the community circle. Uh, in terms of all children, uh, Simple things like regular bedtimes, regular times for getting up in the morning, ensuring that ch children have adequate time to prepare themselves for school in the morning, that there is nutritional food available for the child in the morning, etc., to assist the child getting out to work or out to school, encouraging the child around education, encouraging the child in relation to the importance of education and the benefits of education, and assisting the child to enjoy the educational experience, and I accept in a number of cases parents themselves may well have had a poor educational experience, either through their fault or others uh, within the system, but I think it is a duty upon all parents and guardians to ensure that their children are attending school. Any issues the child faces can be discussed with uh, the school principal, the board of governors, and indeed educational welfare officers are, are there to assist parents and families when a, child's when a child's attendance drops below a certain level. So there's a number of mechanisms in place, but family support, as in many other aspects of our life, is crucial. I call Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, given that attendance is not compulsory within preschool setting, what efforts are being made to develop positive attitudes among parents in regards to the attendance of their child? Um, preschool education is not a statutory element within our education system and has grew over this last period of years from 1997 when it was first introduced. And given the, the one-time concern about the number of preschool places available, the competition among some parents to obtain free school or preschool places, I think it's only right and proper that if you do 
obtain a preschool place that your child uh, attends. I don't have no, con considering that the attends or that stage of our education system is not statutory, there would be no point in bringing forward uh, any statutory issue around actual attending of it. But I think it is the most valuable part of our child's education. Uh, it helps to develop the child in terms of its social and communication skills and assists the child in preparation for primary school. So when parents do achieve a preschool place, I think it's very important their child attends on a regular basis. I call Robin <coughs> Swan. Has the Minister had any conversations with any of his other ministerial colleagues either across the water or throughout the EU about how they actually tackle um, per school attendance policies? Um, I have not had specific conversations with any of the ministers in relation to this matter, uh, but we do have regular conversations about the educational system in general, uh, particularly with my Welsh counterpart and indeed my counterpart in Dublin, Rory Quinn. So all aspects of education are covered. What we are trying to achieve is achieve an education system which is attractive to our young people and delivers results uh, for the individual and also for our economy as well. I call Kieran McCarthy. Question number three to the Minister. All sectors have a role to play in providing a network of viable and sustainable schools to meet the preferences of parents. Given demographics over this last number of years and projections going forward managing removal of surplus places is a natural consequence of ensuring we have a system capable of effectively meeting needs of our society and going forward. As there are a finite numbers of pupils a number of pupils for which education provision is required. Any growth in one sector will inevitably impact on other sectors. Surplus places are un or unfilled places are defined as the difference between the approval enrolment and the actual enrolment of a school. The overall level of unfilled places will only reduce to an increase in the pupil population, a reduction in a school's approved enrolment number, or a reduction in the number of schools. I call Kieran McCarthy. I thank the Minister for his response. But given the potential for integrated schools to provide for much more sustainable education into the future, um, was the Minister disappointed that there was so little consideration of integrated schools in the plans produced by the local education boards, library boards? Um, all the area plans, those published in terms of the post primary plans, are now being uh, sifted through a steering group, which also consists of the integrated sector. And I have on record as saying that when shared education opportunities arrive, whether they be shared education or integrated opportunities arise, they should be followed uh, by the relevant authorities. But and I can appreciate the member's support for integrated education. I am not questioning that. But I do not believe that integrated education is the sole answer to surplus educational places uh, moving forward. When we open up an integrated school or an Irish medium school or a maintained school or a controlled school, it takes a pupils from one or other of those sectors or a mixture of sectors, perhaps an integrated sector, it still leaves you with surplus places. Integrated education stands in its own right and should be promoted and facilitated in its own right, not simply as a way to reduce school surpluses or school place surpluses. I call Pat Sheehan. I would have lost Con Corla. I wonder could the Minister give us his uh, assessment of this issue of surplus places in our system and what plans, if any, has to remedy this situation? One of the driving forces behind area planning has been the fact that we have significant um, surplus places within our schools estate. If we are to create a sustainable schools estate moving into the future, we have to deal with that and we have to deal with it in a planned way. Uh, over a number of years, we have seen school closures, schools being allowed to uh, die on the vine as such, where everybody were over a period of time, parents or demographic changes have taken place, or confidence in the school has, has changed, whatever it may be, and a school gradually loses numbers and numbers. And the managing authorities were not taking a responsive role to that. I believe through area planning we can now take responsive roles much earlier in the process to either secure the sustainability of a school going into the future or take actions to close the school if necessary and protect the educational outcomes of the young people attending that school. But uh, I believe both through area planning, through how we budget and finance schools and how we encourage sharing uh, within our schools the state, we can reduce surplus places. I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers. In the absence of the ESA, 
Can the Minister state who should take the lead at a local level in trying to promote a shared educational pathway as a possible solution to addressing the needs of the threat of some local primary schools? Well, I think the lead ideally should come from parents and pupils uh, and teachers and boards of governors of schools. Uh, that's, that's where the lead needs to come from, and uh, in terms of that should be responded to by the managing authority, whether that be CCMS or one of the boards, uh, and moving forward, I think they should re respond positively where there is a demand for a shared education uh, programme moving forward. I call Stephen Nguyen. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how the demand for integrated schools is... Uh ascertained in areas where integrated schools aren't available? Um, integrated schools, as with any other school, are the demand is measured in terms of parental preferences, in terms of responses to uh, school places, etc. Also through in terms of community projects or community programmes of work. If parents wish to come forward and establish an integrated school uh, in a rural area, uh, 12 pupils can establish an integrated school, and in an urban area, 15 pupils can uh, establish an integrated school if there's no other schools available in the vicinity. So there is the, the process is there, and the process has been simplified over the years to assist parents to promote and bring forward plans for integrated education. Moving on, I call Sydney Anderson. Question four, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, my department is not involved in an investigation into alternatives to free school meals as an indicator of social deprivation. My department takes the view that entitlement to free school meals is an effective indicator of social disadvantage. Free school meals entitlement has a number of characteristics that make it the most reliable indicator for identifying social deprivation. It relates to the individual pupil, so it's more robust than a spatial measure, which assumes everyone in the area is alike. It is updated on a yearly basis, so it is current. It is clearly gathered at school level and is available to us a part, as part of the census return. It is highly correlated with multiple deprivation measures and with income deprivation affecting children index. Where appropriate, the department utilizes spatial methods of deprivation, for example, the multiple deprivation measure and information on the residents and neighborhood renewal areas are used in relation to a number of its programs such as extended schools and sure start. The view of the independent panel that conducted the review of the common funding scheme was that free school meals entitlement provides an indication of the relative concentration of potentially disadvantaged pupils in a given school in a way that no other indicator currently does. I call Sidney Anderson. I thank the Minister for that response. But can I ask the Minister to comment on the response uh, from the Children's Law Centre that I have here to his proposal to reform the common funding formula when they state that the use of free school meals as a primary indicator to allocate funding fails to capture the needs of all vulnerable children, nor will it address low educational outcomes for some groups of children, in particular children with special educational needs. Um, I totally reject their finding. I believe that uh, when anyone looks at my record in relation to special educational needs, no one from a fair basis can suggest that I have discriminated against children with special educational needs in any way. And no one, in my opinion, can bring forward a sound argument which suggests that changes to the common funding formula which I have uh, suggested, which make no changes whatsoever to uh, funding for special educational needs, will disadvantage children with special educational needs. So I reject their commentary. I call Maeve McLaughlin. Good, and I thank the Minister for his, uh, his answer. But can I ask the Minister then why uh, poverty and social disadvantage still play a determining factor uh, in our school and education system? The reason it still plays a factor is because we have not taken any actions to robustly correct it. And those who criticise free school meals entitlement, and those who criticise directing further finance and more finance towards uh, large um, groups of children with free school meals and social disadvantage, have ignored that fact for decades. I am amazed when I see all these people coming forward now talking about the rights of children, talking about the rights of socially disadvantaged children, talking about the rights of special educational needs children, talking about the rights of children in general. They have ignored for years the fact, and it is a fact which is reported in the All-Party Public Accounts Committee report. It is reported in the Independence or Bob Salisbury's report and other statistical information we have that a child in free school meals is less, half as likely, half as likely, to do well in education as any other child 
in education. Now, I'm not ignoring it. I don't believe as a society we can continue to ignore it, and we have to tackle it. The, the consultation responses are currently being analysed in, re, in relation to this. It's worth noting that the majority support the principle of tackling uh, educational underattainment, at tackling it and, and using me identification measures. There's differences of opinion on how we should do that. There's certainly differences of opinion on how we should do that. But if someone comes forward, or as a result of the consultation process, we can come together with a formula which, which tackles all those issues, I'm prepared to accept that formula. But those who have ignored this for years can now not come forward and lecture me on uh, ignoring or infringing on the rights of any child. I call Danny Kinnahan. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer already. Um, although in the consultation, I don't think there was a, a question there that specifically asked you to come up with your own ideas. But has the Minister investigated the policy of using data from super output areas rather than individual households as criteria for assessing eligibility to free school meals? And if so, what was the result of that investigation? One of the principles of a consultation is surely have you an alternative. Mm. Surely that's the central principle of a consultation. If you go out with a consultation and say, do you agree with me or not, that's a ballot. It's not a consultation. Mm. They're different. And I think there's certainly a duty upon all the political parties and those who, who strongly condemn me for uh, using free school meals entitlement and tackling this mm -hmm. issue. There's certainly a duty upon those parties to come up with alternative. But as I stated in the House before, I spent a weekend reading the political parties' consultation responses and no alternative was provided by any of them. In relation to super output areas, as I said in my original response uh, to Mr Anderson, there is a direct correlation between high concentrations of free school meals and areas of deprivation. You're not going to find an area of relative wealth or middle income where you're going to have a high concentration of free school meals. Or you're not going to find an area of social deprivation where you're not going to find a high, or high level of free school meals. Both of them correlate across to each other because the children, particularly going to primary schools, travel relatively short distances to that school. So, members, and we will examine all elements as to how we fund these issues, but members keep avoiding the fact, and keep avoiding the very important fact, a child in free school meals is 50% less chance of achieving an education than a child is not in free school meals. Somebody needs to answer that question for me when they're criticising free school meals entitlement as an indicator of social deprivation. Because it's not an indicator of social deprivation, it's an indicator of something. It's an indicator that child is not succeeding in education, we need to do something about it. I call Sean Rogers. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. International Research Minister shows that there is a strong link between education achievement and the occupation, education and economic status of the children's parents. Would you have any thoughts on including those factors in future measures of uh, education disadvantage? I would argue that is exactly what I am doing. Um, the, the, the financial position of the parents states whether a child will receive free school meals entitlement or not. So there, that will mean either the parent is unemployed or in a low income background, which probably will be a low skills post, which will also indicate the educational background of the parent. So I, I would suggest that by using free school meals entitlement, I'm doing exactly what the international research suggests I should do, and also carrying out exactly what the Public Accounts Committee in June of this year, which all the parties in the chamber signed up to, suggested I should do so. As I say again, Sir Bob Salesbury's report uh, said I should do. Now, this isn't an idea I woke up with one morning. I thought to myself, you know what I think is a good idea? Free school meals entitlement is a social indicator of deprivation. I wonder would that have any correlation between the outcome of a child's education or not? It is based on sound international research and local research. There's no one else has come forward with another indicator or an alternative indicator which measures in a way which free school meals entitlement does. But the fact is this. There are some parties in this House who do not want to and are stridently opposed to giving more funding to schools with a higher concentration of social deprivation regardless of how it is measured. That is the simple fact of the matter. And I stated this previously. In 2006, when the direct rule minister forwarded more money and a very, very small amount of money 
towards social deprivation. The DUP objected to it then. This is not about what we call the indicator. This is about doing the actual thing of giving more money to schools with higher concentrations of social mm -hmm. deprivation. And that's what the debate's about. I call Cahill O'Hushin. Um, I've got the last question for Kirsty Verkuy. I've got question five. My Department's response to the Public Accounts Committee report on improving literacy and numeracy achievement in schools is contained in the memorandum presented to the Assembly by the Minister of Finance and Personnel on the 23rd of August 2013. I have accepted all of the 16 recommendations outlined in the report and have provided a detailed response to each of them in the memorandum. In particular, the PAC report also states that, free, that the large gap in attainment between pupils who receive free school meals and those who, do, who don't cannot continue. As a result, they strongly recommended that DE undertake a full review of the current common funding scheme in order to target funding to where it is most needed. That is what I have done. Since coming to office, I have continued to implement policies to raise standards and tackle educational underachievement in schools and address the gap between pupils who are entitled to free school meals and those who are not. These policies include the school improvement policy, every school a good school, the literacy and numeracy strategy, current read succeed, the learning to learn framework and SANE and inclusion review, but to name a few. I have also provided funding for a range of additional interventions with a focus on improving standards in literacy and numeracy across all sectors. I call Cahill O'Hashin. <coughs> uh, does the Minister agree with the PAC that more must be done uh, to mitigate the effects of poverty? I, I do agree. Um, and when we are aware of the fact that 80% of a child's learning and learning experiences take place outside the classroom, we cannot ignore the family and home background and the social circumstances a child may find itself in, in its home background. We have to take on this. And yes, it is a challenge for some schools. It is a challenge uh, for our education system. It's a challenge for me as Minister. But the the programme for government, in its first paragraph, clearly states that the programme for government will grow the economy and tackle disadvantage. I intend to do that. I believe this policy carries out that function. And time and time again, how many reports does the Assembly have to receive, even its own report, from the Public Accounts Committee, one of the most highly respected committees in this building, when it tells you that you should, one, review the common funding formula with a view of directing more funds towards uh, social deprivation and free school meals, and two, it also indicates that children in free school meals have uh, less of a chance to succeed in education. Do I just ignore it because it's an uncomfortable conversation, because it may uh, cause ripples, because it may cause consternation, because it's controversial? I heard one expert recently say these proposals should be dismissed because they're controversial. What, 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 you know, we're politicians, we're, we're political leaders. If we were to avoid everything that was, that was controversial, we would have achieved nothing in this society. So none of the arguments presented thus far have deflected me from the point of view that we have to tackle this issue. How we tackle the issue, I'm open to discussion on that there, but I'm not avoiding tackling the issue. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've listened very carefully to the Minister and I'm sure he'll agree with me that literacy and numeracy is the most emotive issue we can discuss. Can the Minister tell us that after 15 years of this Assembly and several Public Accounts Committee reports all making the same recommendations, why have we still several thousand children leaving school each year not able to read or write? Well, I'm glad that the member has suggested that over a 15-year period, I'm only aware of one specific report from the PAC committee which refers to tackling this issue, as I am doing it. But if you're telling me over 15 years they've been recommending it, I'll tell you why nothing has significantly changed, though levels of literacy and numeracy are continuing to rise, but not at fast enough pace for my satisfaction, and the gap still remains. I'll tell you one of the reasons why, because we haven't been determined enough to do anything about it because we have avoided the issue of funding it, because we cannot expect our schools who are dealing with high levels of social deprivation to carry out that task on the same basis as a school which is not dealing with high levels of social deprivation. We don't ask any of our other public services to do it, and it's beyond me why we're asking our school system to do it. And that is the end of our list of questions, and we now move to 15 minutes for topical questions, and I call John Lynch. The last can call you. Uh, could I ask the Minister, has there been any progress in recent weeks regarding the complete payment of increment pay to those education staff entitled? Thank you. 
Um, as you're aware, it was agreed in 2010-11 financial year there would be a two-year pay freeze for public sector uh, workers, except for workers earning less than £21,000 a year who receive an increase of at least £250 in those years. All the departments, ALBs, paid eligible staff the £250 payment for 10-11 and 11-12 years. I decided that there would be a further £5 million to cover costs of the £250 payment to all eligible uh, education staff in both 2010-11 and 11-12 financial years in the voluntary schools and grant-maintained integrated school sectors. Non-teaching staff in these sectors have not yet received the payment for either 10-11 or 11-12 years. All of the necessary approval, approvals as required under the Executive's pay policy are now in place. Schools have been asked to provide details of all eligible staff to it. Over 90% of schools have responded. In relation to other increment payments, there was a late, the agreement didn't come through until July. It is usually through in April. Uh, I have given all approvals within my own department. This is a public sector pay issue that has to go through the approvals of the, of the executive as well. We have taken measures to ensure that in future years this will be dealt with much more quickly. But I accept uh, and understand the frustration of those staff who have yet to receive their payments. But I can assure the House and I can assure those staff that my department is doing everything within its power to ensure those, that money is, is paid out to those staff as soon as possible. I call Sean Lynch. Um, going away, criticising my area and Fragrishing, and uh, I accept the Minister's assurance, but can he, the Minister give an assurance that such delays will not happen next year? Well, we have taken a number of measures uh, in terms of annual pay increases and increments, and we have split those, and we have uh, got agreement from DFP to move that forward in the, in the manner in which we are doing now. I believe that will decrease delays in future years uh, and ensure that we do not run into this problem again and ensure that workers receive their payments that are due uh, in proper time. I call Chris Hazard. Good last can, call you. Uh, can I ask the Minister for an update on a recent trip to Ontario, Canada, please? Um, I, I travelled to Amer Canada and America uh, at the start of October. I particularly wanted to visit Ontario as it had went through a program of radical change over this last 10 years in relation to tackling educational underachievement across the board, and particularly tackling educational underachievement from those in socially deprived backgrounds. I have to say the, the debate and the discussions I had with both the Minister, senior officials, trade unionists, uh, and teachers and parents on the ground was very enlightening. The debate they had 10 years ago is a debate we are now having as to whether you should direct more funds towards social deprivation or not. They did direct more funds. Their educational gap has closed, are closing much more rapidly than ours. They are seeing the educational outcomes for all the young people in their society, and Ontario proudly boasts that it's one of the leading education systems uh, in the world. So we have a, it was a very useful visit, a very informative visit, and it just shows sometimes that insular thinking that we're guilty of in this part of the world sometimes actually hinders us from making progress on many issues. I call Chris Hazard. Go on, late last can call you and I thank the Minister indeed for that answer. I am fully aware that not all lessons are transferable to this part of the world, but I wonder if the Minister could maybe outline um, some of the pertinent examples and lessons that maybe he brought home um, that we could apply to our own system. Go on, good. Well, the most obvious lesson to be learnt is this. If you wish to tackle education underachievement among those from socially deprived backgrounds, you have to fund it. You cannot wish it away. You cannot hope that the same funding system will work for those from more affluent communities than those from less affluent communities. You have to take dedicated action to resolve that issue, and Canada has achieved that. Now, they also gather uh, mammoth amounts of information in relation to individual pupils, uh, and their, their school censuses are very, very detailed about the background of a child, the background of the parents, the authenticity of the child, and, and they, can, they can follow a child right through their school career through very, very detailed data and put in place targeted uh, systems to assist the child through its journey. I don't think our society is ready for that just yet, but I do believe that the major lesson to be learned is if you have the evidence what resolves an issue, then use that evidence and resolve the issue. I call Alex Atwood. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, given the Minister's responsibilities for the nature and content of teacher training, including teacher training numbers, can the Minister indicate whether he is satisfied that his input to and arguably his ownership of the Dell Minister's current Stage 2 review into teacher training 
Are you satisfied that your voice has been fully acknowledged and that your input is comprehensive into that stage two review? Uh, I have no doubt that the member is only too acutely aware that I have no ownership of the review, that it is a responsibility for the Dale Minister in relation to the current review he is carrying out. I can assure the member that I will uh, make input to that review where I, my areas of responsibility are. I have taken part in, ter in terms of trying to give surety to our education colleges that I have set numbers for the next two years, which wasn't previously the practice. I have set the numbers for the next two years in relation to teacher numbers and the regards to teacher training. But this is solely a matter for the Dale Minister. I call Alex Atwood for supplementary. I thank the member for his answer. Given that the Dale Minister said in this chamber in oral questions on the 8th of October um, that uh, the current situation when it comes to teacher training is not sustainable, to use his words, and uh, added whether you are talking about the system generally or about St Mary's, it is not su financially sustainable today. Are you concerned that the Dell Minister is rushing his fences and getting ahead of himself when it comes to this review, given the clear responsibilities you have in respect to teacher training? I, I can read the member's press release to the Andy Town News and <laughs> other West Belfast newspapers as I rise to my feet. Uh, I am not responsible in any way for the Dale Minister's review as to how the Dale Minister answers questions in this Assembly. And I would suggest that the member puts his name in the lottery for, or, for topical questions to the next, meet, or the next session of the Dale Minister and ask him those questions. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, can I ask you for an update on the area planning? Currently going on in Ballymena, declaring interest as a governor two schools in the town. Um, I can give you an update in relation to Bali. Uh, Bali the consultation in relation to Bali ended today in relation to the programme or the develop, development proposal in relation to that school. Uh, I will take t my officials will receive the information now from the board and collate all the information we have gathered in relation to uh, Bali. It was, sorry, was Bali I met yes. Uh, in relation to Belay, we will bring all that information together and then at a future stage I will make a decision in relation to the future of that school. Uh, I, um, I have not got the information in front of me in relation to the other school, but I am happy to share that with the member uh, in written form. I call Robin Swan. Thank the Minister for his answer. I think he knew where I was going to go in the supplementary. In relation to the proposed closure of Bali that is ongoing at the moment, does he not think that actually pre empts area planning if the school is closed before a full area planning scheme can be put in place? And would he also like to comment on the Better Way proposal that was put forward by the governors of Bali School when we met him twice? Uh, the member will appreciate that the consultation is now closed and it would be unfair of me and indeed I would be in breach of my statutory duties to give any views in relation to as to whether the development proposal was timely or not. I, that would form part of my deliberations before I make any decision in regards to that matter. Uh, I have to say I was impressed with the, the views expressed and the plans brought forward by the Board of Governors. Uh, I have had two meetings with them now, or representatives of the Board of Governors. I have had two meetings with them now. The decision, as in many other circumstances I deal with, is has those interventions taken t place in time, and will they be able to ensure that the current pupils and future pupils will be able to achieve excellent and good education within that facility? That's, that's the deliberations I'd have to uh, think about uh, in the weeks ahead. I call Michaela Boyle. Can I ask the Minister, uh, he has announced this morning a review of transport. Can I ask him why is this necessary? Um, it has been a considerable number of years since we have had a review of transport. Uh, it dates back to 1996. And indeed, in the early part of this current mandate of the Assembly, the uh, Assembly voted that I would conduct a review of home to school transport uh, in all of its elements. I have set Fourth, a review today um, with uh, Sean Thornmate, Margaret Martin, and Tony McGonagall, who are all highly experienced in the field of education and transport issues, to report back to me by August 2014. 
I call Michaela Boyne. Gormo Ogut, uh, uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer? And can the Minister outline to the House what are the tem- terms of reference for the review? Gormo Ogut. Well, the, the, the terms of reference are quite significant and lengthy, and I don't have them all in front of me at this moment in time. But it will look at all aspects of home to school transport. It will look at in terms of the financial viability of our current practices around home to school transport. Uh, other areas which have been raised with me in recent times has been post-16 provision and the choices being made and being maybe limited by transport provision for post-16, uh, etc. I also want to look at in terms of how we um, support some of the most vulnerable young people in our society in terms of special educational needs. I want to look at cross-border transport provision as well. But I am happy, and no doubt they have been shared with the Education Committee, if not they will be, uh, and I am happy to share those with other members of the Assembly, the terms of reference. I call Patsy McGlone. Gurma, good last year on Corlea, because we have selection Ida. Thanks very much, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his previous answers. Could I ask the Minister to give um, an update on proposals for the new build at Holy Trinity Secondary School in Cookstown? Um, Holy Trinity was one of the schools I announced in the January 2013 uh, announcement. Uh, uh, to bring that bill to fruition, we require uh, confirmation from CCMS in relation to area planning in that area, and as to how they propose to build that school up to around 1,300 uh, pupil schools. I believe that CCMS have been engaging with my department, and they have provided figures as to how they propose to make that a reality, uh, and that will allow us to progress forward. Uh, we then have to move forward, obviously, to detailed design, uh, procurement, etc., which will take a number of years to complete. I call Patsy McGlone for supplementary. We have slat, I guess we have slat, and So, just following on from what the minister said, has his department then not agreed pupil capacity with CCMS for the new build? Uh, go on, Boykes. Uh, Relation valve or in case. I, I, it's not a case of me having to agree. I have agreed in principle. I have agreed that I want to see a 1300 uh, pupil school at Holy Trinity College. Uh, CCMS have brought forward, they said they agree with that, that they want to see a 1300 pupil school in that area. I believe, uh, and I stand to correct because you appreciate it with all the details in front of me, uh, but I believe that uh, CCMS are preparing plans as to how that will be achieved in the period of head. But I'm I'm not concerned uh, in relation to this matter. I believe that Holy Trinity College has got the green light. In fact, I know it has. I give it to it. And that build will take place in the next number of years. It's it's a core central school in that constituency and will continue to be a core central school in that constituency, only in a new building. I call Phil Flanagan. The Minister may be aware that along with MLA and some other political parties that last week I met with the with the Chief Executive and the Deputy Chief, Chief Executive of CCMS to discuss the future of Brella, and they informed us that they have procedural difficulties in approaching schools or managing authorities in the south to explore a partnership approach. Can the Minister give me um, and other MLAs that are interested in, in this proposal um, that CCMS are free to approach Donegal VEC or any other schools to explore a cross-border learning community for that area? I am not aware of any power I have to stop them. Uh, carrying out such exploratory work or indeed engaging with schools across the border. If they require my permission to do so, I can assure you I would give my permission to do so, but I am not aware of a power to stop them. If it is a case of me having to go through protocols on informing Minister Quinn or indeed the Department of Education and Science uh, in Dublin, I am more than happy to do so also. My main interest in this is that to ensure that we have a viable, sustainable educational uh, facility or facilities. Uh, in, in that area. I call Phil Slanningham. Government, the last and I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Uh, um, work that, that has been done in the local area demonstrates that over, over the required number of 24 subjects can be delivered at a GCSE level if there is a partnership with schools in Ballyshannon and Bundoran. But given the, the reluctance of, of CCMS to actually bring forward or to look at this matter, would he be inclined to, to try and discuss this at some future stage with the Minister of Education in the South, Rory Quinn? Uh, I am happy to raise the matter with Minister Quinn, uh, either at one of our formal meetings or, or an informal discussion uh, with him. Uh, I have a meeting with the Area Planning Steering Group this week, and they may present an opportunity for me to raise the matter, or CCMS may well raise the matter with me at that. And that is the end of questions to Minister.